if you haven't noticed, we are recording this panel session. And so um, we promise that um, this will be enlightening, but um, uh, also available to be publicly um, shared with, with the broader audience. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands that we're connecting in from today. Uh, the beauty of virtual events is that we get to be dialing in from various parts of Australia and beautiful lands across Australia and possibly abroad too. I, I know that we had a few people register um, that were outside Australia, which is quite exciting. Um, today, I'm dialing in from the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I'd like to pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge um, Aboriginal elders who may be with us today. I'd like to briefly introduce you to SSE, for those of, of you who are new to us, um, why we've invited three amazing panellists today. Thank you, Michelle, Chad and Brandon, to be in conversation with us today. And then hand you over to Daniel Smith, um, SSE's Innovation Program Lead, who'll be the moderator of the panel session and then provide further context of the topic that, um, that we'll be diving into. So SSE, uh, Sydney School of Entrepreneurship, um, was established through collaboration between 11 universities and Take New South Wales. We work at the intersection of education, industry and government to build a diverse community of innovators and entrepreneurs. Our focus is on building innovation applied entrepreneurial capabilities to support employabilities, job growth and prepare Australians for the ever-changing dynamics of today and the future. More recently, uh, we've noticed that in the conversations that we've had with industry, government, that there is a renewed sense of the importance and a focus on how innovation ecosystems can play a role in supporting and fueling economic development across regions from metro to non-metro areas. To support and, and amplify this, um, we've been working hard to create and, and contribute to educating and inspiring the creation and growth of local innovation ecosystem. An example of this is our collaboration um, with Brandon and City of Newcastle um, with the development of a, our second iteration of the virtual startup internship program, specifically focused on three newly smart city focused startups and scale ups, which is designed to create a bit of a window into what it's like working in these innovation hungry ventures. Um, and since we launched it about three weeks ago, we've had over 450 mm -hmm. um, participants sign up and be part of it, which is really, really exciting. To date, um, the program, the Virtual Startup Internship Program, has over 1,400,000 ,000 virtual interns starting to getting a look into what these fast-growing, uh, innovation-rich ventures is, is all about. So I really believe that this panel discussion is going to be valuable for ecosystem builders and facilitators who are already doing some fantastic work in helping your local regions foster and, and be a vibrant uh, community, as well as individuals within organizations curious about how do you get started? How do you start these conversations? And importantly, um, councils who want to learn more about how do you support the economic development of your region? So I, I think it's gonna be an exciting and enthralling discussion. Can't wait to get into it. Um, I'll now hand you over to Daniel Smith to get the conversation going. Awesome, thank you so much, Em. Um, so I think as, as you can all imagine, when you're thinking about ecosystem uh, or innovation ecosystems, uh, there's, there's a lot of ground that we could have possibly covered anywhere from, from statewide ecosystems all the way down to, to individual organizations. So for this discussion, we've really gonna try and focus on the importance um, and the activities that contribute to the growth and maintenance of innovation ecosystems in, in local regions. Um, so I hope, I hope that that will provide some, um, some insights that will be, be valuable to you. Um, so without further ado, um, let me introduce our brilliant panelists um, and then we'll get into it. So our first panelist is uh, Michelle Long. Michelle uh, is an Associate Director of the Sydney, Sydney Startup Pub, accommodating up to 2000 people across 11 floors. Uh, the Sydney Startup Pub provides startups with access to mentoring, networking and investment and brings together leading incubators, accelerators and innovation programs in one central location. Um, in this role, Michelle provides high level advice relating to the hub, its operations and designs and implements programs which are aimed to strengthen and support the ecosystem and make New South Wales the most effective place to grow a startup. Prior to this, Michelle held operational roles with the ABC uh, as the National Manager for Business Partnerships and Corporate Social Responsibility. Welcome, Michelle. Um, 
Awesome. Uh, so you are on mute as well, Michelle. Um, so uh, our next panelist uh, is Chad Renando. Uh, Chad is mapping and measuring the impact of entrepreneurs across Australia by helping governments, universities, corporates, uh, innovation hubs and entrepreneur programs measure the long term impact of their innovation investment. His focus on showing how regional entrepreneurial activity contributes to community resilience. Uh, Chad comes from a diverse background that includes manufacturing circuit, for, uh, circuit boards that went to the moon, managing uh, the digital agency that expanded pizza ordering online, running Australia's first fully local government owned innovation hub, playing war games on a sonar, uh, as a sonar technician on a nuclear powered submarine in the US Navy, and a brief stint as a radio DJ. Um, so a very, very diverse background there, which is exciting. Um, he's currently a research fellow with the Rural um, Economies, Econ Economies Center uh, of Excellence at USQ, a research fellow with the Australian Center of Entrepreneurship Research at QUT, director of the not-for-profit not startup status and managing director for Australia with the Global Entrepreneurship Network. Welcome, Chad. Uh, finally, our third panellist is Brandon McIntosh. Brandon is the Innovation Ecosystem Facilitator at the City of Newcastle. Uh, through helping to grow and establish innovation ecosystems, Brandon supports the development and growth of startups, entrepreneurs, innovative small to medium enterprises and smart citizens in the City of Newcastle. Uh, Brandon believes that through creating the right mix of econ uh, economic conditions, people and opportunity can be brought together to create growth. Uh, like any ecosystem, an entrepreneurial ecosystem requires a fertile environment to sustain and grow prosperity. And Brandon's achieved, Brandon achieves this through fostering collaboration and connection with the community, allowing them to thrive in the ecosystem. Welcome, Brandon. So I think, um, I think as you can all appreciate um, from, from the background of each of our three panelists, that there is a very diverse set of um, perspectives on innovation ecosystems and, and especially when we're, we're trying to focus the lens on, on local ecosystems. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the, the discussion um, that we're going to have uh, on that topic. So let's get into it. Um, where I'd like to start is, is by focusing on how local regions can realistically create a form of an innovation ecosystem. Um, I think it's quite easy to think about innovation ecosystems as just something that happens uh, in, in big city centres or places with a lot of money or high populations. Um, so where I'd really like to, to kind of focus on or answer the question is, is how can satellite um, and, and remote regions actually create and sustain an, an innovative ecosystem? Um, Chad, would you like to, to start? Sure thing, Dan, and thanks for the intros. Um, it, it, is a, it is a really good question in that uh, and it's one that's being asked all over the world um, in regional communities outside of city centers. Everybody talks about, you know, the next Silicon Valley, how do we, you know, the next Sydney, the next Melbourne, um, but in places that don't have the density and Australia is the, the fourth least dense nation in the entire world. And so how do we solve this? And if we can solve this, this is actually a really good exportable product for others looking to, to address it. Um, and, and I do take a bit of a, a principle-based approach. What we really need to do is figure out how do we replace what we take for granted with physical connectivity in a city center with potentially social or digital connectivity in regional communities. Um, and so a few principles that we can follow there. Um, one, we do need to get everyone around the table. We mentioned before, as far as local governments having a role, uh, we've been talking a little bit about that in some of our prior conversations. Um, but not necessarily owning it entirely. And so we need to find a way to then get the corporates around, get the universities around, get the local established businesses, a local chamber. It takes more broader participation, rather than, whereas in a city center, you might have one or two dominant actors that, that take the lead. Um, it also helps to focus everyone around a challenge. What we find in a lot of the communities is that uh, if you get everybody around to talk about entrepreneurship, talk about innovation ecosystems, after about six to 12 months, you're only going to have the people around the table that get paid to have those conversations. The people that are actually doing something stop showing up because they're actually getting on with it. And so focus on a challenge that's relevant to as broad a, a community as possible, but, but solve something unique to that region that will then attract other people that want to be a part of that solution. Um, support your local leader. Almost invariably in every region, there's that local person that's just passionate about supporting entrepreneurs, fuel them and feed them. Some of the worst things that we've seen is where you actually set things up in competition with existing momentum and energy that somebody's actually doing. Support the local advocates uh, and back them, back people to actually be the entrepreneurs 
um, and then step out of the way. Uh, and finally, tapping into your established businesses. Um, the narrative as far as a, a black t-shirt, skinny jeans, in an innovation hub, entrepreneur coming up with a brand new idea is great, but you're going to have that less in regional communities. So a lot of the stuff that comes out is the citrus grower trying to solve the, the workforce issue for, for coordinating casual labor during seasonal times or the, the person creating a new hardware technology doing pruning um, that can then solve that for anybody else who has a similar kind of crop. Um, so we really want to tap into those established businesses um, rather than always trying to think we're going to create the best next new thing uh, in regional communities. So just four, four ideas on kind of what we've seen in some of the regions that would help. Yeah, definitely. I think I think technology obviously allows for a lot of that kind of uh, innovation to take place almost wherever. Um, but that unique um, aspect of, of an area is something that I think you mentioned in that um, you need to around the challenge, a unique challenge for that area, something that, that can find very valuable. Um, Brandon, the city of Newcastle has obviously a, a focus on, on smart cities. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on on that and, and how, how that has helped the innovation ecosystem in Newcastle. Yeah, definitely. I think Chad's right. I think having that um, ongoing challenge um, is important and, and moving on from that um, initial conversation of what is innovation, what is an innovation ecosystem um, and making it relevant to your region. So it's not just about trying to, to mimic a, a Silicon Valley vibe, but actually um, making it relevant to who to, to your community um, because the ultimate purpose of the ecosystem um, is to be a resource to accelerate uh, innovation and entrepreneurialism. So it should be about assets and tools and support that help your particular community. Um, and so, so I think that's a really important message. Um, and that's something you can see here uh, in Newcastle is we've really gravitated around um, our smart city and, and how we uh, in Newcastle can um, innovate to so solve challenges for the rest of the world around sustainability, um, livability, and, and how cities work. Um, and I'm sure, and Daniel as well, he, Dan's actually in Newcastle, and I'm sure he can attest to, to our huge smart city focus here. And Dan also works out of 1804, which is our, our smart city incubator. So we've really sort of built a community um, around this idea of the smart city. Yeah, definitely. I think it, it, it's definitely helped everyone focus their, their efforts. and and organizations that aren't not necessarily just council but supporting organizations figure out or, or at least imagine how they can support the efforts of of the region michelle i think it would be um, really interesting to get your perspective on, on this and and how um, maybe those regions can play um or or, or can uh, gain support from from the the state or the the the, the larger ecosystems in the city as well There we go. Okay. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, look, I concur with um, Jad and, um, Chad and uh, Brandon um, completely. I think uh, the local communities need to know who their main actors are. So that's, you know, your, your local councils, uh, whether you've got any, um, your, your local industries um, and your biggest advocate. I agree there's always someone in those regions that um, is really passionate and driving innovation within that space. Um, and I think what we need to focus on is, particularly here at the Sydney Startup Hub, is trying to have that hub and spoke approach. So we do a, a lot here. How do we push that out into the regions? How do we make it accessible to you, to, to the various actors in the game out there? Um, and vice versa, how do you push back into us? How do we grab the, the content and the amazing innovation that is happening in those regions and bring that back in here? Um, so I think we do it, but we can probably focus on doing it a little better than we currently are. Um, and uh, I think advocacy, your community needs to know what's going on in, in innovation. So that's where you need all of those actors lined up together um, uh, people with skin in the game and they're all talking about it. The community knows who's out there. They know what they're doing. They know what problem they're solving. There's not just one. It continues. There's networking. You know, there's investment placed in into um, innovation. And that doesn't necessarily have to be dollars either. There's all sorts of ways that investment can be put into um, innovation in those um, eco regional ecosystems. 
Yeah. I think that there's a common theme um, and I think you guys identified it um, with all your answers around activity um, and, and really being quite proactive and um, advocating for certain things and, and focusing the efforts um, of, of different players. Um, so trying to dive a little, maybe a little deeper into those, those activities, what are some of the, the actual activities that could be used to stimulate this unique innovation ecosystem? Um, in a region and, and to generate involvement from innovators um, and industry, uh, as well as communicating the importance of that ecosystem to, to the general public. Because obviously an ecosystem kind of by default involves everyone in that region. So what are some of those activities um, that, that might support that? And, and Brandon, I'd love for you to start. Yeah, um, I can give a really practical example from, from here in Newcastle. Uh, when they launched the Smart City program a couple of years ago, uh, they developed these series of events called Innovation Quarterly, uh, or as we call them, IQ. Um, and it's a series of four events that happen every year, every quarter, um, every year. And, it's, uh, and each one is a little bit different. And it served as a real platform to engage all the, sec all the elements of the ecosystem to really come together um, in one room and not just speak at them, but include them in, in developing and growing the ecosystem. Um, so the way it works is we have, uh, we start with IQ Compass, which is a, a networking style event where we, where we pick a topic and we try to uh, design and think about where we want to, how we want to solve that and where we want to take that. And so it's about setting the direction and where we want to go. Uh, we then follow up with that up with IQ Talk, uh, with a talk that relates to that compass setting. So we bring in a keynote speaker uh, and we do that at our, our civic theater and we invite the whole community to come and engage in that conversation. Uh, we then follow that up with IQ Ignite, which is about how do we, what, what, how do we, how do we solve these problems? How do we, how do we create solutions um, and coming up with some different ideas? Um, and then that is then followed by IQ Summit, which is like our conference day where we come together as a panel to, um, you know, to explore these ideas and reflect on what we've done over the year. So by having these events, it's an opportunity for everybody to sort of come together around the idea of the innovation ecosystem and the smart city regularly. Um, and having it over a quarter means there's not too much, um, you know, not too much pressure in, in people's calendars and diaries. Um, and we try to make it a really special and engaging event that people want to come up to or want, want to come to. Um, and that's really served well in, in helping us to build our, our innovation story here in Newcastle. Um, but that, but if you sort of, if you haven't got that scale um, in your budget and in your programming, um, I2N, which is our local incubator, an innovation hub here in Newcastle as part of the University of Newcastle. Um, they've really tackled this really well. They do uh, sort of monthly events such as a startup stories where they just invite a local entrepreneur just to come and talk uh, once a month to their community and then join the dots where they bring together three, three panelists to talk about um, different elements of the ecosystem or different parts of the startup community um, and tries to, to connect things together for you. And it's such, a, it's such a simple thing that they're doing. It doesn't take a lot, but it's created really huge impact uh, and momentum here in Newcastle. Yeah, I think that, that there's some really interesting um, points there around creating activities for different segments of, of the ecosystem as well. Um, but part of the, the one kind of discussion, like the IQ Compass, you've got obviously different, different events that target different um, areas of the ecosystem. Um, Michelle, I'd love to get your take on, on that as well. Oh, sorry, Michelle, my audio is not working. Or at least the, the... Uh, can you hear now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Um, yeah, look, I, I realise that a lot of regional New South Wales um, innovation hubs can't operate at that scale, or perhaps they're actually just talking about it now and how do we bring innovation into um, our community. So I'm gonna talk about the opposite end of the scale to Brandon. Um, I think it's a matter of starting 
in small bites. It doesn't have to be a huge impactful um, um, approach to innovation within the community. As I said before, I think advocacy is probably one of the most important things. The whole community needs to know what's going on. Um, and if you've got a few good news stories or a few wins on the board, the whole community is going to be behind you. Um, and having the community behind you and having the community wanting to, to be involved in some way is, um, is half the battle. I think um, local government can play a role as well. And I talked about investing and it doesn't necessarily have to be um, dollars. There could be a uh, empty building in the middle of the, the high street. Main Street um, that uh, could be offered to um, entrepreneurs, uh, small business um, minded um, companies uh, to start a, a co-working space. Um, that that is a good way to start as well. Get get bring the people together. It's like the Sydney Startup Hub um, on steroids, I guess. So we created the hub. The um, the bricks and mortar uh, and people came and you can do exactly the same thing in the high street um, of a regional um, town. Uh, and then um, uh, programming. So you do also don't need to look at your own programming. There's programming in metro areas um, uh, or there are uh, companies that you can source to do programming that might fit a niche market within your own um, industry. So I guess my advice is if you are looking to, to start uh, an ecosystem or you're wanting to keep the flow of an ecosystem um, uh, going, they would be my, my top points. I guess and another thing the local, government, uh, local council can do is offer um, shared services. So can startups come and use your printing services at, at the council? Um, and again, that is an investment, but it's not a necessarily a very expensive investment for council. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting um, point, Michelle. I actually think it's those kind of activities aren't just limited to just councils as well. I think there's, yeah, there's sure. industry and businesses within those regions that can actually play those supporters. Yep, you're 100% right. There are um, regions that have really strong industries um, and wealthy industries, and, and, and if you can get that industry to back you, um, again, it's not, it's not necessarily asking for lots of dollars, um, but it is offering that investment in some other way. Um, so that, that support, um, and, and really, again, as I said, the advocacy, I think it's the most important thing. Yeah, advocacy at multiple levels as well, I think, in, in terms of community, industry, um, government, and, and that will help to draw out those innovators. Yeah, sorry. Michelle. Yeah, well, Chad um, touched on it before. It is There are so many um, people with skin in the game in, in the community. I mean, I refer to them as actors, um, and you do. You've got your government, whether it's local, state, um, you've got your industry, you've got universities. In a lot of cases, there are universities um, within these regional um, hubs. Um, uh, so yeah, so there's lots of actors that need to be part of this process and it's getting them on board as well. Yeah, definitely. Chad, I'd love to get your perspective on it as well. Yeah, you bet, Dan. And there's some really good views have been said. And I might, some of the things I'll say, uh, probably consolidate a bit of that uh, and support um, some of the others, great to have the wisdom in the room. Look, and, and I've been involved in projects building ecosystems in towns of, of 600, 6,000, 60,000, 100,000, 600,000. And it, it's different along the way, but there's common principles throughout. And so if I break down a lot of the activity I see, it, it can generally be in one of three different forms. And one of them is just community. And we've heard about things like having the barbecues and having that consistency that Brandon spoke about of just getting people together on a regular basis and creating that narrative that this particular thing is important. What you focus on, you create, no matter what aspect it is in life. And so if you, as a community, focus on entrepreneurship, innovation, keeping in mind that those are charged words, they have meaning, and they may not mean the same thing for everybody. And so quite often when I go into community, they say, so if you want to do something new, that might be creating a business that gets customers in a different way, maybe uses some new form of technology, and engages markets maybe outside of this region, what would you do? Now, obviously I could shortcut that by saying, so how would you build an innovation ecosystem? But that 
so it's using the right language. So first thing is getting that community and socializing the concept. Second is clustering, getting like-minded people around. Is it tourism? Is it ag? Is it a particular aspect of ag? Because ag is varied, obviously. You know, some places it's 95%, you know, cattle and copper in a region. Other ones, it's going to be horticulture and, and, and citrus all over the place. And third, then, is the challenge, that open innovation type concept. Um, where you point the entire community at something for a period of time, but then build that out. I'll give you a couple of really brief examples. Like when we ran the Innovation Hub in Ipswich, we did a couple of really short, sharp hackathons. And keeping in mind that that term means different things for different people, but one of them is, um, you know, because we were attached to, to local government, one of them was we were the fastest growing region in, in all of Queensland, and 60% of our land was natural estate. And so how do we, um, how do we grow without devastating our natural land? That was our problem statement. So we got about 50 people into the hub and we ran an enviro hack and the, the solutions that came out of it were really good. One of them became an award-winning app um, using machine learning to recognize stuff. Um, and Brandon, I think you were part of, the, part of the team at the time way back in the day. Uh, and so we, we um, uh, mobilized people around a topic. Another one is barking dogs, number one people by reason why people call counsel. And again, just a fun thing to mobilize attention. Um, and, and, but the other thing around this is, is developing a structure in your community that can have this conversation. And when we talk about funding, quite often the pitch I make, particularly to local government, is this conversation we're having, this economic diversification, economic transition, um, it's a specialist skill that you may not be able to hire within your economic development team and council. And if you were, that's like $150,000 conversation for on cost for a staff just to do this thing. So what would it look like to fund this kind of narrative on a regular basis from multiple parties? And, and so you create that network in your community that can then get a daily operating costs run. And then you get additional funding to run some of these specialists, whether it's the clustering or the specific challenge program. Um, to be able to address some of these, but definitely have it a dedicated conversation and being intentional. And a couple of other um, just examples that you can see, there's the, the Marinoa Innovation Network that's happening up in Roma. And even on the, the list here, I see Paulette from Logan, who's developed their Innovate Logan platform, which is a similar kind of um, a group that's getting together to have this chat. So just a, a few principles and approaches that I've seen work in different areas. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. I think like you're mentioning, it's um, very much uh, uh, mobilizing people around a challenge and, and a challenge that is, is faced by the community. Um, I think that that's a, that's a really um, key element to that is, is making sure that people understand the benefit of, of the challenge and, and or benefit of the solution to the challenge. Um, and that can rally, rally everyone. Um, I think we, we've talked a lot about um, advocacy um, as well as the, the community. One, uh, I, guess, I guess in some innovation ecosystems around Australia, there's been the continued increased focus on, on I guess, the truly open and inclusive innovative ecosystems um, that, so that, that it really ensures um, that, that everyone can be involved in that ecosystem. Um, I'd love to get your perspective on, on the importance of having that open and accessible innovation ecosystem um, what that means uh, and, and how can you go about supporting this kind of inclusion? Brandon, do you want to um, start and kick us off? Yeah, sure. This is sort of something we're kind of um, approaching at the moment in Newcastle and thinking about how our innovation ecosystem supports and reaches entrepreneurs uh, of all kinds. Um, so not just focusing on, on the startups or uh, that stereotype that Chad was, was pointing out before. How do, we, how do we engage everyone? How do we make this a tool that's available for everyone in our local economy to use to, to rapidly scale an idea? Um, as a city, we're making a transition from being a um, primarily primary heavy industry um, into this new knowledge and innovation economy. Um, and how do we connect uh, uh, existing industry, small business, um, the chronically you know, unemployed? How do we bring um, people with, with different abilities um, and diversity um, and migrants uh, to feel connected in this ecosystem? Um, I was really lucky to be on a... Um, a Zoom thing like this uh, that Chad set up, and I think it was with Andy Stoll, and um, yeah, cool, I got the name right. Um, and he was saying we set up the, the these ecosystems to support and, and 
and help people, but it's often they're, they're fundamentally helping people that really could find that support anyway, because they have access and privilege to it. So what if we set up our ecosystems to support those people who, who don't have this access? And then in fact, if we did that, our ecosystems would be more, uh, more powerful and accessible and stronger tools for everyone, because if we're helping, um, helping those that, you know, the more diverse communities, um, then we're, we're, we're helping everybody. So it's just, it was something that really sat with me and made me really sort of um, rethink, uh, you know, the way we approach innovation. Yeah, I think it's definitely crucial to be including everyone in that conversation. Um, Michelle, I'd love to get your take on that as well and how you might go about um, uh, facilitating it as well. Uh, this is an interesting um, topic for me. Uh, Dan and I spoke about this very briefly yesterday. And to be honest with you, I had to stop and think, um, wow, is this an issue? Because I think it's been part of our ethos at the Sydney Startup Hub right from the very get-go that it is 100% um, inclusive environment. And uh, But I think that was an, a, not necessarily a conscious um, approach um, to our ecosystem. Uh, and then when I stop and think about why that is, I guess we always talk about the ecosystem as a bit of a funnel. So, you know, the widest end of the funnel sort of petering down to your um, niche startup scale-ups. Um, and, and obviously along that, that journey, uh, there are different requirements that are, are needed. And I guess we're, we're already focusing on those different levels uh, or different areas of the, um, of the funnel. So for the very early stage or brand new people that are thinking, have an idea and they don't know where to start, we're trying to offer programs that really help them to, to draw them into the ecosystem. Um, and then along the way, there are um, MVP grants and VP grants and, and you know, all sorts of, of offerings, not just from government, but throughout the whole ecosystem. Um, and I guess from where I sit, that means we are, in a sense, making sure that um, whoever, whatever your uh, startup idea is or wherever you are on that journey, we are trying to make sure that there is an offering for you to continue that, that you know, um, journey throughout the funnel in the ecosystem. So, um, you know, I mean, yeah, I, I would like to think that... Um, that sort of offering can happen anywhere so that we don't have environments that are uh, non-inclusive. I think the offerings of the ecosystems are open and, and do provide that road mapping, but we went out and did a whole lot of engagement for our economic development strategy. And the issue arose where it became uninclusive was like the language we were using around startup hubs and incubators and accelerators and something orators and it was more around those issues and what, what we don't see because the nature of innovation is, is to be open and inclusive, but it's thinking sort of that next layer down of, of we, where our philosophy is open and inclusive, but how is our language, how are the, you know, how is that accessible? I guess is the point I, I'm trying to raise. Well, yeah, okay, that's interesting. We did a whole um, definitions piece last year around, you know, how do we define some of the language that we use and maybe um, it, it would be good to make that more accessible to others. Um, but again, that's our definition on, on, on some of the languages. But yeah, that's, it's a really interesting point and it's, you know, good to be able to start thinking along those lines to make sure because we definitely want our um, ecosystems to be inclusive. We don't want people feeling like it's not for them or they can't be part of it. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting to see the, the difference. I, I mean, like I said, we've, we had the conversation yesterday around it and um, I've also had a conversation with Brandon and I was part of part of the, the most recent IQ Compass event where that inclusive innovation was, was one of the topics in that language. Um, so different regions, I think, seem to have different levels of um, or, or different perspectives on the problem as well. And, and would love to hear it. So if there's yeah. anyone on this um, webinar that has examples or, you know, we're, let's let's solve the problem if there's a problem. Great. Awesome. Chad, Ch I'd love to get your perspective on it as well. 
Yeah, you bet, Dan. And it, it is so. A couple of things. One, it is a, it is an issue because there's core and periphery, right? There's a lot of peripheries out there based on age, based on region, based on uh, indigenous uh, gender. Um, there's a there's a core aspect of ecosystem services, and that is completely understandable because the ecosystem services itself is a fringe, right? And it's there's, there's only so much money to go around for so many resources, and it quite often goes to the lowest common denominator. Um, take, for example, entrepreneurial education in schools. You know, the uptake that we saw, you know, even five years ago was the ones who could afford to pay for those kind of services. You go to something in rural, regional, remote area, and they're going to be struggling to get an entrepreneurial education throughout the curriculum, just because they don't have the capacity or capability. There are certain things embedded into this, the, the system that deter people from accessing. I felt it when I was running the, the, the one point whatever million dollar investment in the innovation hub in Ipswich. And here we are, concrete floors, glass walls, nice new Schmidt building. And I knew that the people that were walking down the street and sometimes sleeping on the park bench right outside my hut would have no chance of walking through my door. Yes, I was inclusive, but in my, and to be quite frank, my white privilege standing there saying, we're open for everybody, but some people just did not feel appropriate to come in, no matter how I framed it. And so there's such a, an opportunity then to go to the communities by having those people. And we are seeing more and more of this. So the ecosystem that we saw back in 2015, when everything exploded with the government ideas boom, and it launched into all these hubs, we are now seeing representation. For example, um, Dean Foley with Baron Morrill down in Victoria, or Tanya with Circular Nation up in Northern, North, Northern Territory. So what's happening in Mindaroo and all of the female support for entrepreneurship, which, which just wasn't even a conversation five or six years ago. But I think what's happened is people have gone through the ecosystem, identified this challenge, and you can't do ecosystem work without it drawing you into the social work, drawing you into the, the gaps. When I did the tour over the US, you go to Silicon Valley and you see the, the massive demarcation between the have and the have nots. Innovation is morally neutral and left of its own devices, it will increase the gap between um, those who have advantage and those who don't. Yes, it will lift the overall uh, lower levels of poverty, but it will also increase the gap. That's just a natural expression. And for us to not do that, we do have to be intentional. And I think that voice has to be those who do not already have access. Um, and what that looks like, I think, needs to be tailored for that periphery. So uh, a physical innovation hub in a community may not be the way because it's virtual and they're disparate and, and there are a whole bunch of towns of 600 to 1200 people. Um, and so a physical single location may not be the way. So there might be something virtual or the, the, the stacked barriers to some of the communities um, that, that are already uh, don't have access. You may need to address a whole bunch of challenges first before they're ready for that entrepreneurial conversation. And so I think we do need to invest in better understanding, invest in different languages, and invest in those people that can have the conversation more so, potentially, than even the four of us staring around at the Zoom screen now. Yeah, very, very interesting. I think it's a, it's a developing conversation. I think it's something that a lot of ecosystem supporters are, are, um, are, are coming to and, and, and considering about how to address. Sorry, Michelle, did you, did you want to respond to that? Uh, yeah, I think I was going to say I I, um, I totally get the virtual um, approach, but I think you've got more benefit in having the virtual and the in-person hub if you can if you're able to do both. There are uh, big benefits there. Um, I think we you know understand that um, anyone starting out a new business it can be a really lonely journey, and the virtual is only is finite. There is you know there's not a, the virtual might be an hour a week or two hours a week or perhaps a bit more. But if you also have the in-person and, and you are willing to kind of travel, even if it is some distance, then you seem to have um, both, which is a big help. And we know that it's a very lonely journey to start with. So, um, it, it, you know, it's really important to be able to have a balance there. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Chad, did you... Yeah, no, that's um, absolutely, Michelle. And, and it does look different. And I've seen a few comments here on the chat of hybrid and, and absolutely. Um, like, again, Gunna Wendy has a business hub where people can come together, but quite often it is in the pub, it's a cafe. Uh, Gunna Wendy is really interesting because they got four or five cafes on Main Street and the people there use the cafes for different reasons. Some of them, they go into work, other ones, they go into network. This cafe they use for just having a coffee. Um, yeah. So um, it's... It is that that hybrid, whereas sometimes I've seen if 
for places that invested heavily in the, the infrastructure of a hub, it, it is empty for most of the time. It's almost like what I refer to as a church model, where they have their services, everybody comes in, um, but then generally through the week, it's an unused asset. So we really need to balance that carefully. Yeah, it can be an unused asset anyway. So if even if it's getting some use, it's right. um, it's kind of a double-edged short sword, I guess. I think, um, yeah, I, I think a big part of it is it depends on, on the region. I mean, if you've got a town of, of 1,200 people, um, a, a hub is probably not going to get a huge amount of use, um, or, but whereas a, a virtual um, thing might, a, a virtual platform might have a bit more accessibility and then you can have a, a hub nearby or something like that as well to have that option, like you said. Well, um, look, I, I think we're getting close to wrap, wrap up time. So uh, look, there, there's been so many really, really interesting points um, brought up in terms of um, ways to, to generate that um, community and that ecosystem and, and create that momentum through advocacy, building a, or creating a physical space for people to, to collaborate and, and connect, whether that is, oh, sorry, physical or virtual space for people to collaborate, connect. Um, and then that, that inclusivity, I think, is a big or is a conversation that is that is evolving. And, and I think it's something that um, we're hoping to continue to have as, as part of these types of events. Um, so, look, I, I think I'm, I'm probably going to need to, to wrap up now. But thank you all um, very much. Uh, I've got some closing closing slides but um thank, thank you all very much for for joining us today um just before we finish up there, there are a couple more points i'd like to draw your attention to uh, we are planning on holding a small group um workshop in the coming months with hopefully a number of key stakeholders from from government industry um, and education to discuss to, to discuss some key issues and opportunities regarding innovation ecosystems across non-metro new south wales so if you would like to be involved in that uh, workshop or you'd like to talk to us about how we might be able to support you and in, in your innovation ecosystem um, please reach out reach out to me um, daniel.smith at sse.edu.au um, i know that there's uh questions that, that some of the audience members had um through that they submitted their registrations and signups and there's probably many more questions that, that have come from this discussion as well so um I, I think there might might have been one or two in the in the chat and if you do have any more um please do email me um we're, we're planning on hopefully creating a continued discussion um in this area and so we're hoping to get to to more of these questions and explore these questions with some of the the leaders in the ecosystem um, so again, uh, best place to reach out is daniel.smith at sse.edu.au. Um, and uh, we are also going to hopefully record uh, some answers to some of those questions as well after this session to, to release on our social channels. Um, to please look out, please look out for some of them. Uh, if you'd like to, to get in contact with any of the, the panelists directly, uh, they all have LinkedIn. Um, and they're all linked on our on our LinkedIn social posts as well. So you can do that or, or email me and I can um, can see if they, they're open to connecting. Before we finish off, um, we do have a quick survey uh, just to just to help us get some feedback on how you found this event, um, help us improve and, and let us know if this is the type of event or these types of events are, are things that you would like to uh, to continue. So you can use the QR code, or I think uh, uh, there is a link in the chat as well. Uh, so for your ease of access, it's a very quick survey. Uh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you, panelists, very much. Chad, Michelle, and Brandon. Um, very, very interesting discussion and, and something that uh, obviously a lot of ground that we were able to cover in 45 minutes. So thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Evan. Thanks, guys. Thanks.